are these people? Over the last couple of weeks, we've featured your uh, experiences in Gaza, which we, I think our audience has enjoyed. And actually those clips have been doing very well for us on YouTube, for us on YouTube, which yeah. I think is great. Um, so, and having you come on so you can kind of build that out a little bit more for our audience. Uh, but we have recently covered your experience, experiences with Pal in Palestine on the show. Tell our audience what brought you to reporting on the Middle East and in turn your time in occupied at Palestine and Syria. Uh, yeah, well, thank you both. Um, and thank you so much for um, for reading through my articles, part one and part two uh, from Occupied Palestine. I really appreciate that. Um, gosh, I'll try to keep it not so long winded, but basically I went from being 100% politically ignorant Right. Um, you know, throughout <laughs> my uh, university uh, years um, to uh, while I was living in South Korea, teaching English, paying off my university debts in my second year there, uh, having Internet in my apartment. And after having done extensive traveling just for the sake of traveling uh, through South Southeast Asia, after my first year in Korea, uh, I, I just I returned uh, there and I had to work again, obviously, to to earn some money. And but I I had a thirst finally for uh, information for news. I mean, obviously, I was always interested in various things. I was a classical pianist in university. I love languages, um, but I was not interested in politics. And I think uh, that's been a, a blessing to me because. I wasn't indoctrinated as much as I could have been by, you know, Canadian schooling and Canadian so-called news media. Uh, instead, I just kind of was away from all of that. And so I, when I approached things, it was more like a, you know, I didn't have any knowledge. So I was really interested to understand. And so in, in that second year in South Korea, I, um, I started... I mean, this is in the 2000s, um, dating myself here. <laughs> um, but I, at that time, in the early 2000s, they were still talking about the Second Intifada, right? And uh, I, I had, I knew nothing about Palestine, nothing at all about the history, about the uh, ethnic cleansing, about the Nakba, nothing. Um, and so it hit me very strongly what I was seeing. Um, and so every day I'd be listening to particular news i won't say who but, well i've said it before but i don't want to endorse them because they they're they're crap now but at the time they were reporting on palestine so um i just was appalled uh how this occupied palestine all the all the things we know about how palestinians live under uh, oppressive uh israeli rule i didn't understand how this could be happening i, I was that naive and as i consumed more news and tried to educate myself, I decided, well, the best way is just to go there. Now, I didn't get a chance to do that until some years later. Um, in 2007, I went to the West Bank. I traveled to Jordan. I crossed the Allen Bean Bridge. I did it on my own. I, I wanted to be sure I could say, like, I paid for it on my own. I went to my own. Um, and then I did eventually join the ISM, the International Solidarity Movement. And in doing so, uh, throughout the next eight months I spent in the West Bank, I saw some of the worst oppression that Palestinians endure on a daily basis. And um, when you see that kind of thing, it really affects you, obviously, because, you know, I think we all have fairly safe, somewhat comfortable lives. And then you yeah. see even just the injustice of Palestinians being made to to wait in these long lines at this, the the dehumanizing checkpoints. I mean, even right. just that, um, and and those can be fatal uh, because if you're in need of medical care and they're not allowing you through, then people die at checkpoints. But even that is just already bad enough. But then I was to see Israeli invasions of Nablus, Israeli invasions of of um, towns near Nablus and take testimonies from Palestinians whose children had been abducted or one teenager who shot in the abdomen and lost his spleen. You know, yeah. all these things that I was seeing. Yeah, it was, it was before I went to Gaza, but it was for somebody who grew up in a very safe Ontario, mostly environment, and I'd never seen anything like that. It was very, um, it, it, ha it had a huge impression on me. And uh, I mean, again, through through those eight months, I saw kind of like almost every aspect of what life is like for Palestinians under occupation. 
for example, the um, the uh, very violent attacks of the illegal Jewish colonists um, that are enabled by the Israeli army and police. I saw that firsthand, the theft of Palestinian land. I saw that in Susia, which is south of Hebron or Khalil. Um, I saw how Palestinians just trying to do the very basics, um, like harvesting their olives, were prevented by the Israeli legal mechanism and then the Israeli army and then the, the illegal Jewish colonists who would attack them, including when I was with Palestinians. So, you know, I, I saw, I, I think, pretty much every aspect that Palestinians tried to protest peacefully the theft, the Israeli theft of their land and being met with a barrage of tear gas canisters, high velocity tear gas canisters, which if fired at the body can kill yeah. as they have or rubber bullets or live ammunition. I saw that repeatedly in Belain and some other villages. Um, and so, it, like I said, it had a profound impact on me, like it does, I think, pretty much anyone who goes and sees even a glimpse of that. And so after that point, um, I was eventually uh, deported from the West Bank by the Israelis. Um, and I'd already decided I wanted to go to Gaza and I had tried to, I had an internship with the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, but there's no way for me to go from the West Bank through Israel, through the Arabs crossing and into Gaza. They wouldn't allow me. Right. And then I was deported. Um, and I had met uh, some of the original organizers of the Free Gaza Movement. I'd met um, them when I was, I think it was when I was in Hebron or Khalil. And so I contacted them and said, you know, I'd like to go to Gaza. Can I join your movement? This is after spending three or four months in Egypt trying to cross in via Rafa, but I had no means of doing so. I was just trying. And they said, yes, you can join us. So um, I did join the third boat that went in November 2008. Then we made it to Gaza. I don't know how, I don't know how any of the five missions that went to Gaza made it, but we did, even though there was an Israeli gunboat flanking us to the north about a kilometer off. Um, because as you know, in subsequent years, I think two years later in 2010, the uh, the massive uh, Mavi Marmara flotilla was attacked savagely by the Israeli army. Um, and uh, now I'm sorry, I forget the number of people, nine or 11 people were killed. Um, and so our our boats somehow got to Gaza. And, and so I stayed there for another year and a half um, after arriving. Um, the 2008-9 war began on a horrific war. Of course, nothing that compares to today, today but at the time it was horrific. And we started volunteering with the Palestinian medics, with the um, Hillel Ahmar, which is the Palestinian Red Crescent, and going, uh, I was in the north in Beit Lahia, Beit Hanun, Jabalia, and, in, and Gaza City when I wasn't with the medics, trying urgently to write up the reports of what we were seeing. Um, anyway, fast forward, uh, I, I did leave in mid-2010 via Rafa, um, and then I came back a year later and stayed for another year and a half. So in that time, you know, another Israeli war in 2012. But aside from that, I think, um, because we all now know what Israeli genocide looks like, but a, a lot of what I was seeing that isn't still very widely broadcast are the the um, just endless Israeli policies designed to make life unliv unlivable, even when they're not outright bombing Gaza. So, for example, obviously, the brutal uh, siege or blockade in Gaza, which was imposed in 2006 or seven, severely limiting um, the entrance of goods, including necessary goods, necessary medicines, uh, fertilizers, livestock, as you know from my article, well, this is um, when they started but also prohibiting the calorie counting, right, for Palestinians? Yes. Yeah, so Which... Amira Haas is an, an excellent Israeli journalist. She wrote about that, and she, she, she highlighted how they calculated the amount of food aid that was necessary just to sustain life, and they, they cut the amount of trucks by uh, now, if, I think it was a third or almost half, you know, like that's, and they said, they specifically said, you know, oh, we're going to put the Palestinians on a, a diet, diet, which is a really sadistic uh, way of saying we're going to starve them. Yes. You know, so that was, yeah. that was 15 years prior to uh, October, 2023. Right. So right. there's that, there's, there's them gunning down farmers and fishers. So eradicating their ability, the Palestinians ability to, burn or catch their own food. There's the the creating the conditions for the water to be contaminated and not, you know, not allowing any sort of solution. Yeah. So all these these policies, you know, before our current situation of 11 months of Israeli genocide of Palestinians in Gaza, all these policies were designed to slowly kill them, if not kill them quickly.
Yeah. So that's a round, that's a very, sorry, detailed answer of how <laughs> I got involved, at how I began reporting from uh, the Middle East, from Palestine. But then um, if you want, we can continue like uh, Syria and elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I, oh, well, just as a follow up to that, if you don't mind me asking me, well, how did your family feel about you going over there, especially at that, not as well known now, but the risk that you were kind of taking in wanting to be there and eventually making this your life's work now? Um, they were supportive. They didn't try to stop me or they didn't say I shouldn't go. They were supportive. I, I guess, <laughs> I mean, before I got political, I did a lot of traveling on my own as a you know young single woman. So I guess, you know, back in the day before internet was a, a real thing, I was traveling around and hitchhiking around. So I guess I already, <laughs> I'm sorry, my parents, but I guess I'd put them through a lot of <laughs> unnecessary <laughs> worry about right. you know where is she now <laughs> last time we heard she was going to volunteer on a farm somewhere in ireland and anyway um but sounds also, all right to me they you know <laughs> oh it was brilliant ireland yeah. was my first love i love that country and i i, I did hitchhike around the country n numerous times and uh volunteered on organic farms and had amazing experiences but yeah i also put my parents through the stress of not knowing if i'd reached my destination and if it was a safe place or not so <laughs> but they 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 also my parents weren't over they weren't very political you know they were also they were musicians um and you can actually see a photo of them up there i don't know if you could see it up there yeah right that's, that's my mom and dad they're they're classical musicians and so my people um they love it yeah <laughs> so I I don't know. I think at first they they knew the basics about what I wanted to see, why I wanted to go to Palestine, but I don't know that they knew necessarily, you know, how dangerous it is for Palestine Palestinians, excuse me, or people who bear witness. But then when they did, they were still supportive. Obviously, they want to be safe. My dad at one point said, you know, it might be better if you stay in Canada and, and do things here. I'm sure people could use your help here, but right. um, that was him, him trying to uh, keep me home and safe.